Today, Simon Schools returns and we talk all things YouTube, all those hidden little things we didn't talk about last time. Why I'm now blogging locations on YouTube, captions and how they can affect you in search, YouTube shorts, why you should use vidIQ and more. Go to the video. So what's been happening? So we spoke, I mean, we've been chatting a lot anyway, but we spoke last on the live in April, I think it was. So it's a long, yeah, not it, it, far. It, 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 Lockdown. Many, many, many months when you know we, we thought that we'd be in <laughs> lockdown for two weeks and everything would be fine. Yeah. yeah. And here we are in October. It's Groundhog Day. It's, it, it's, it really is. It, I think I was probably wearing the same shirt. Um, <laughs> so, I what's been happening? I know, been I know I'm probably likely to be. I, I, I have yeah. I, I, 50 billion black t shirts. It's just a wardrobe full of black. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but it's but well, like I say, six months, five months, six months. What's been happening in the, in that period of time for you? Um, for me, the advantage I have is because I'm in the space teaching people how to use digital media in some way to shape a business. I've had a a, a rather generous boost during this time. People are trying to learn how to live stream, how to set up a YouTube channel. Um, so my my YouTube channel's exponentially grown. Hit 24,000 subscribers today, in fact. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. Um, when at the start of the year, I just passed 10, 11,000. So over doubled the, the size of my channel just through this period. And whilst that's autopiloting itself, I also started to step out into blogging. So the rather weird progress of moving from video to blogging rather than blogging into video <laughs> and that in itself i've gone from 1000 organic views to, in my blog to around about six seven thousand views organically wow. all because the idea is that if i have the content and i know that these videos work quite well if i can then give people the option to consume me in other media they will choose whatever media they decide whether it's podcast video format blogging mini uh, content, that kind of thing. So as long as you give them something and you remove the friction, then they can choose how they wish to consume you. And, and that's exactly what I was just going to say. It's all about just removing that friction. If I don't, if I read, then how can I consume what you've got to say if you already do a video and, and vice versa? And, and if I don't have any time, how can I consume it? Well, a podcast would be a nice way and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, repurposing. Well, that's it. Like from our own um, little chat a few months back, I was able to take not only the interview itself, but then rip it into micro content, which then was either on videos on my own channel, uh, whether it appeared on my social media, or yes, individually showing up in podcasts as well. So I'm just generally trying to broaden the spider web that is my my uh, awareness, my brand. Yeah. Um, and that tends to work for with anyone, but that's my my new pet project, trying to do the one thing that I always failed for for 10, 15 years, which is creating written content. And it's doing quite well. Yeah. And driving organic, not only traffic, but affiliate links and, and trainings and just generally builds multiple pillars. That way, if YouTube disappears, I'm not left in the dust. I've got multiple things. Yeah. And, and, and blogging is the one for me that I, probably the same as you. I'm probably just a little bit lazy when it comes to sitting down and writing. Um, and so I'll do it, but not very often. So when I do do things like lives and what have you, I will go off to something like Rev, get a transcription of it, and then just literally write into the into the blog, this is a transcription of a recent live. And then there's that written content there. So that, there's still that regularity of that written content coming up. So there are ways around it essentially if you can't be bothered to sit there and go all well, right i'll write a blog for ages it, it's not necessarily the best seo way or key keyword strategy but um it's, it's a way around it that i've come across that um i use now and again <laughs> if i really can't be bothered to sit down and or just don't have the time to sit down and, and write a blog it's not necessarily about not being bothered it's about finding the time to do it um because it's probably one of the more time heavy content. the published author that yes had a book yeah, enough time to write. Um, I, I agree. Get getting a transcript. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Excuse me, oh, I'll just mute myself. My sarcasm. It's brilliant. Um, yes, Rev works. The advantage here is also, if you was to to strip that audio, and then dump it there, that that works well. You can put that in other content as well, like alt text in social media platforms. But you can also then go back and then humanize it at a later point yeah. 
Now you can always go back and remove the 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 colloquialisms that you you would do within your own speaking pattern. Exactly. And then write it up a bit better and link it to affiliate. That's that's how I started my blog initially, ripping my larger content and then just going through and just the ers and the ums because Rev are fantastic with yeah. doing every edge of your speech, the gaps, the ers, the ums. I know that I interject with things like right yeah <laughs> it's my educational brain i stop for a second for, for you to understand that you got what i said right yep mm -hmm. that doesn't play out in a blog as much so you kind of trim those and then yeah. put them. no that works fantastically for, for a better way of putting it i, I bastardized my blogs basically if I, if I go back into it and, and do do exactly what you're saying it, yeah it's a, it's a great way of doing that um quick hello to angelina who's just joined us and um, so last time that we were chatting obviously we spoke all about youtube but we spoke specifically about the stuff people can see so it was about youtube thumbnails and it was about the titling and the description and all that kind of stuff when we finished i was like there's a lot of stuff we haven't covered there's i mean there's a lot of other stuff that people can see which we'll come to in a bit but there's a lot of stuff that we haven't covered that are the true true behind the scenes things connected to youtube so we still talked about meta tags that people can't necessarily see but I wanted to try and pick your brains a little bit about some of the stuff that when you go to the more options page on YouTube and you start looking at what's there, it becomes a bit of a mind mash. You're like, oh, I, I, should I be doing any of this? Should I not be doing any of this? So I just want to go through a few things with you and just kind of get your point of view and just see what you think. And um, I'll let yourself cough for a bit for a moment there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm great. I can choke on water. Really? Yeah, I could I could choke on coffee, so it's fine. Um, so yeah, so the the back end, there's all these different things on more options. The first one that you kind of come to is um the recording date and that kind of stuff. Is it important to we'll go through them all, but so what importance does recording date have to put in your content when you put it live? What does the what difference does that make, if any? It's all down to cataloging. Um for the average normal user, me, you, it doesn't have a massive impact. The reason it's there is because in the more advanced platforms, which you don't get to see, there is a content ID section. That means that if you're a business and you are a music producer and you're dealing more with licensing and um, international agreements, the, the date that it's published may be a searchable tool. It's something that you can export. It's something that in the content ID I can check for. And that way you're able to itemize your content a bit more, release date, upload date, recording date. Now, it doesn't have any direct effect on the performance of the video. It doesn't have any direct effect on the algorithm, as, as I'm aware of. It's been around for a very, very long time. Initially, all of these tools needed to be there to placate the larger companies, especially if you are uploading a Family Guy clip and you have proof that you are the owner of Family Guy. You'd have to put only the, the time it was recorded, but the proof that it was aired in the US, and then what's known as uh, captioning, but it's slightly different in the US. Basically, everything needs to be released with specific laws and specific access. Right. Uh, in America, they've got lots of loopholes to jump through. So the publishing date or the recording date doesn't really have a knock-on effect, unlike a few other things within there, such as, say, location and, and things like that. Which is what I was going to come to next. So location is kind of the next one you come across. Um, I've started using it on a more regular basis, saying that when I do a recording, I say what date the recording was done on and also that it was done in Andover, which is where I'm based. It, how does that have an importance on the content? Compared to date in itself, location does actually have a functionality. There's two things that you'll notice. If I was to publish a video and I was to use a hashtag, the hashtag then becomes some part of the, the title of the video. The hashtag yeah. is clickable. The location will override I've that. Just, it does the little, it tells you where it is and then the little like arrow kind of map. Exactly. Yeah. See, the advantage of this is that it, it goes back to niching your content specifically. If I was solely talking about how beautiful Yorkshire is, I could locate those videos for me. And then mm -hmm. if I only ever wanted to see everything in Manchester, or anything in London, or anything specifically in Hyde Park in London, I can 
click through to those locations and it will give you search results based on those locations. So you could get very specific. Say you really want to see the Eiffel Tower and every, well, every video that's been tagged the Eiffel Tower, you can click the location and it will then give you everything that's been tagged in that specific geography. Now, it used to be the idea was that you could rank in those specific areas based on your specificity. Now it's one of those features that, once again, over time, because people didn't use it, it's still a powerful feature, but because people didn't use it, it then becomes less and less worth yeah. your time. Now, I'm not saying that people should stop doing it, especially if you're very specific. So if you're traveling abroad and you want to, for your own sake, put, you know, um, the, the convention center when you're yeah. going to Bitcoin, or if you want to actually have a conversation around an event, that could actually help you. So Would it I'm also help as well, for example, so, so for example, I go to Slovakia a lot, my wife's Slovakian, we go to Slovakia at Christmas. Would then tagging the content with a Slovakian town or Slovakia overall make it more visible, that content more visible to people specifically in Slovakia? It's all down to interaction with that feature. Hmm. Now, it does effectively lend data to that video saying that, yes, I am in London at this time, or I'm in Slovakia at this time. So if you were searching for Christmas in Slovakia, if it's got the metadata that supports that, then it might, everything with algorithms always might, might um, yeah. it might lend an element of additional information that would help. But the, the biggest way I've, I've seen this work is direct events. So if you went to WrestleMania weekend, or if you went to VidCon UK, or VidCon in Anaheim, and you're talking about for that whole weekend, if you were to tag the location, everyone that's in that specific niche bubble that wants to interact with that environment and that camaraderie and that community, they would then know that, ah, oh, he's there. And then they can jump yeah. in, and then it makes it much more specific. It's like using a specific hashtag on LinkedIn when it comes to an event. Yeah. VidCon 2028, when we're finally out of lockdown. <laughs> whatever it might be yeah. well that's it that way you know that you're not interacting with a, a someone that posted that specific video two years ago and is no longer relevant and is no yeah. longer here especially if they're calling for like right i'm going to be in Times square for the next two hours come and find me and the video is two years old then not, not help so would it also work because obviously youtube is google or alphabet which is google um so does it work the same way as when you type in, I don't know, plumber Newbury, and then all the plumbers in Newbury pop up and you've got the map results as well? Would it then draw upon that to help bring up, say there was a plumber in Newbury creating regular content, would it help that content get be pulled up by the search results as well? I've not, I've not specifically seen direct correlation between the location tagged on a video and the the results in search but, but you can place um tags and relevant qualifying information on a video or on a website and have it relate to those searches yeah. so for a very long time i was trying to to rank for um hd1 web design hd1 being huddersfield the central postcode um and not high definition not 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 high definition. It just so happens that I'm old enough that that was also the time when high definition appeared. Because I'm old, so I thought I'd lean in on it. You know, sports HD one. I'll just nick the HD one and it'd be my postcode. Um, so that that hopped on okay, and it would it would geographically locate me. But that was also based on the the the, the syntax that you you placed the schema that you marked your website up with. Um, in other words, the hidden data that you feed to Google to tell. Google, hey, hey, we are here. We're based in this location. Please make it relevant. And then you'd, you'd also pad your website out with accidentally typing things like web design Huddersfield and web design Yorkshire and Cowersley and Bradford. You'd make blog posts and stuff. But specifically tagging the video, um, maybe if you used to go to Google and search for location-based videos, it, mm -hmm. it would form that data. But I've not personally searched that ever. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I but I do know that if I've seen a location on a video every now and then I'll click on that that location to put up the search results. Cool. But, okay. uh, YouTube platform feature rather than a, a general Google thing. Yeah. 
So just another quick one on that then. If you're using the location, if you created, say, well, obviously you, I'm creating loads of content about Andover. I'm not necessarily actually creating about Andover. It's just I'm based in Andover when I'm filming it. But um, if I created then a playlist called Andover, yep. would that become more searchable under that location result as well then? If they, if they clicked on that, would it pull up the playlist or would it just pull up anything yep. people have made in Andover? Anything that is is relevant in theory, there's there's the more <laughs> more relevant information you're giving it, it's certainly not going to hurt you. Mm. Um, if if you're you're explaining that you're in Endover in the in the in the thumbnail somewhere or in the description somewhere, and you're linking it to a tag and a location, if people are then searching for uh, I don't know sightseeing or whatever in in, in Andover, then you you've given it a rich base for it to possibly suggest you more than anybody that hasn't used that. It's always a case of filling in that jigsaw puzzle. Say it's a 100-piece jigsaw puzzle. Uh, Google's going to guess around about 50 pieces in what it is. Yeah. Right? The more you fill in that picture, the more of the fine details it's going to know of that jigsaw puzzle, whether there's a tree in the background, whether there's a church, whether there's a, a kid or a pram or a duck. Right. The more you fill that in, the more specific it is. Yeah. Especially nowadays, there's a, a tool called... Um, I, I, so it used to be Google Brain. I believe it's Google AI. Um, it's cloud AI learning in which it will take a picture of the thumbnail. It will scan through the thumbnail and go red, shocked faced, male, a wow. gray hair. And it, find, and it micro tags them. Um, but it, it now scans through all of videos in the same way. So wow. okay. Mr. Beast went to a supermarket in one of his videos about a year ago. And they, they put this video through the AI algorithm. And what it does is it generates these tags based on exactly what's in the video, not just the tags, the actual video. There, so yeah. Outside of the supermarket, didn't <clears throat> mention the supermarket. It could see the sign of the supermarket and it immediately went supermarket, food, shopping, um, leisure. Yeah. It, knew, it knew those associations. Now, Google has all of this video content and can feed this algorithm to machine learn and teach it. So that's why the more the more of this jigsaw puzzle you fill in for it, the more it can make that association and the more likely that your Andover video is going to be recommended against other Andover searches or Andover videos because they are related in some way, shape or form. Does it appreciate it then? So you saying about all of those, this AI system, does it appreciate it then when when it goes, oh, you're outside a supermarket, so food and shopping. And if you put those things already into your system, into into your tags and into your description, does it go, well, thank you very much. You've already given me that information. I'm going to give you a better ranking. Or does it just go, well, that makes no difference because I've already seen it within the video anyway? It's more it's more validation. Um, <clears throat> my theory is they've been telling us for years that tags don't matter. They do. But they won't in the future. Yeah. Okay? What they're trying to do at the moment is augment what we tell them the video is about and validate it and confirm it with what they know. And that over time, the machine learning will become more and more important and the human element will disappear. Yeah. Right. So if we tell it that it's a vlog and I went to Audi and I bought Christmas stuff and then in the, the, the tags it goes... Uh, in the computer-generated tag mindset, it, it sees a supermarket, and it sees food, and it sees Christmassy stuff. It goes, ah, okay, we got it right. That's one for the machines. Okay, so it's the machine learning rather than actually the machine going, that's good. Yeah, we'll give you a better ranking point. It's just the machine going, ah, oh, thank you. No, I, yeah, I, I was learning correctly. I, I think in the long run, the machine learning will eliminate clickbait. Yeah. Or it will kill it much quicker. Um, you, we already have the machine learning when it comes to thumbnails in YouTube. If you upload something outrageous in a thumbnail, it can identify specific body parts, specific locations, and specific relevant things that you would you would identify as a human being, and it will flag it immediately. Yeah, and that's through the visual element, not the tags. You could have a completely blank video. You could title it X. It doesn't matter. It would then it would analyze the thumbnail and know that that's not what you should have as a thumbnail yeah. or even restrict it or, or remove it entirely. Um, and there's something that does that that isn't human. And that's clearly a machine learning tool that's been taught to recognize those images, whether it happens to be 
educational or whether it happens to be flat out illegal. Um, so there will be things that identify that. And in the long run, I imagine that that machine will become more and more relevant to our everyday life, not just a safety net to, to protect YouTube from abuse. Yeah, yeah. And talking about education, the next one I wanted to ask about was category. Um, okay. now I put a lot of my content into category um, of education because that's what it's generally all about. Does it matter? Would it would it matter if I went? Oh, well, I'm going to shove it in food and drink because I'm drinking a coffee in this in this episode, or um, I don't know uh, people because I'm talking to another person, people and blogs. And does does it really make any difference? See, I touched upon this fairly recently in one of my own videos, but it's once again it's a, a legacy of the old system. YouTube being so old, it had to categorize many things when it first started. If you mm. imagine. Right now, there's like 800 hours of YouTube content uploaded, I think, every minute. I think yeah, it's ridiculous, yeah. Right? So back in the day when it wasn't so dense, maybe 800 hours per day or 800 hours per week, the idea of categorizing them helped them. Imagine it like a forum, right? Good old days, back in the day. You would tell people <laughs> That's what I'm on social media, Yahoo <laughs> forums. Yeah, Yahoo or Reddit, for the example. Yeah. Um, Sub sub forums in Reddit are just subs, the categories. So, in in the good old day on forums, you would be like, "Here's your general chit chat. Here's your downloads. Here's your uh, I I run a wrestling fan website for for ages. So, it'd be like, here's you talking about Raw. Here's SmackDown. Here's TNA. Here's WWE. Right back then, it would help because it would categorize exactly what you are. When you're starting a YouTube channel, it can help. Once again, it's that it's a jigsaw piece puzzle within your big picture, and over time, the behavior of your channel would then overtake it. So if you initially started with people as your category, but then along the way, it's actually tech or actually food, the behavior of your channel after four or 500 videos or 20, 30,000 subscribers or whatever, then YouTube leans on that, what it's relevant to, what traffic it expects, what keywords you continue to seemingly use or get found for. So. It's not a bad thing. Hmm. Some people lean on it a bit too much. There, there's a creator out there um, that had a controversy last year who's very well known for, for putting out videos that look real, but then he tags them as satire or comedy. And then when everyone kicks off, he just goes, yeah, but it's marked as comedy. Don't blame me. Right? Some people abuse the system. Some people yeah. don't. Does it directly affect you in rankings? Maybe. But not really. Like if Marcus um, Marcus Brownlee, who's a, a tech review guy, wants to change his category from tech to people, I honestly believe he'd still be recommended under the tech tab on the homepage. Um, now, I'm not saying that you deliberately go against what you're doing and change it to something different. It might just be, once again, another jigsaw piece puzzle within that big picture that helps. Yeah. And when you're first getting started, then, then go for it. But you'll also notice it's very hard now to individually categorize a specific video now. Um, it used to be very clear. It used yeah. to be an easy drop down. And for some reason, they've hidden it. And if they're hiding it, it means it's becoming less and less relevant. A bit like all of these. And so it's kind of what well, I, I probably won't go through anymore because they're, they're all kind of coming up with the same kind of answer, which is they're helping you, but not necessarily in the most succinct way as they used to. But Kind of what you're saying is use them because they're tools there to be used, but don't expect them to be around forever. It, what, none of those individual things will become silver bullets that make you go viral. You, you yeah. won't, won't go back and change the last 20 of your videos and change its category from from how to to gaming. And boom, that's not that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. But if you want to spend the time to categorize those, then fine. If that's the way that you're wired, then fine. I don't think I've changed the category of any of my videos in three, five years. I've not added locations to any of my videos in the last, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years, right? And it's not hampered my growth on any of my channels or any of my clients. The, the category is something I've, I've done since day one, to be honest. Um, and when I was vlogging, it was always people and blogs. And then as I've changed my content, I've gone, right, okay, now it's definitely more education-based. I don't want people to fall into the trap of, me still being a vlogger and coming to my content and going, well, 
fuck you, you that's not what I care to subscribe for. So um, I didn't really want that to happen. Um, I'd rather they were finding me under the right right category as such. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, coming away from that, the other options page a little bit um, and talking about some of the this, this stuff that isn't necessarily new, but it's, it's been around a little while, but it's stuff that not many people use. So the first one thing I want to talk to you about is obviously YouTube Live. We are live right now across multiple platforms using an, an app called StreamYard um, and one of those platforms being YouTube. How powerful and how important is it for brands and businesses to look at using that capability? And is it more important for them to use it direct on YouTube or are they okay using an app like I'm using so I can go across multiple platforms? Any content creation is the most important thing when you're on the platform. Correct answer. <laughs> any content creation. How, how are people going to find you if you're not making content in any way? I don't care if it's a phone. That's that's my other half. Ah, oh, she's gonna so kill me. Um, I don't I don't care if it's live. I don't care if it's a mobile. I don't care if it's TikTok or Instagram. I don't care if it's a blog. Live gives you the option to eliminate the friction. It gives you a chance to communicate with your community. If you have a community that will interact with you, brilliant. Right. A couple of times I've gone live recently just to to break random industry news. Any way to do it is helpful. Now. You can go live and splice it up into content. You can go live and leave it as it is. You can interact. You can jump on an immediate. It's just, if you're not creating that content at all, it doesn't exist for you to reach your target audience in any way, shape, or form. And then how do they know who you are? Places like StreamYard, it makes it easy. You can jump in. You can add your name. You can add your overlays. It's got a load of nice little buttons that you can transition between screens. It's brilliant right? And for so long, it was so fiddly. I'll just set up OBS and I'll make sure that my settings are fine. And then I'll drag this over and then I click that. Yeah, yeah. Why, is that yeah, yeah. why is that echoing? And why, oh, why is that replay? And now I don't, there's a video playing and I don't know where that's coming. It was a nightmare, right? And if you didn't have the right spec for your computer, then you'd have to change this, the, the bit rate or it'd fry your laptop. I mean, it, it was terrible. Things that are integrated like, like StreamYard, it, it's making it so much easier it's, it's a browser base you can even do it on your mobile phone now right yeah. it's fantastic right i also find that live streaming is a great tool to get your foot into a pattern of recording just not only content but engaging when it comes to watch time now when i was trying to monetize my youtube channel the one that is alan spicer i live streamed two to three times a week the reason for this is me being an educational niche, the views aren't necessarily fantastic because I'm putting out three to five minute tutorials. Here's your question. Here's my answer. There's the door. Done. Yeah. So I used to do two to three hour live streams where I'd sit down and 10, 15, 20 people would come in and we'd chat and we'd go through their questions. Now you've got to think that that's 10, 15, 20 people that sit there for up to three hours. Yeah which immediately gives you that spike of six, seven, eight, 10, 15, 20 hours worth of like live stream hours that goes towards your total watch time. So let's say 10 people watching for three hours, 30 hours. You need 4,000 hours worth of watch time to get monetized on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So if you two live streams a week, you go, there's 40 hours times X amount of months over the course of the year. That's how live streaming can help you specifically on YouTube. Yeah. If you're live streaming for those three hours, you might get the Nick Nimmin effect, which is they will super chat you for, hey, here's your coffee. Or with Nick Nimmin, it's, can you do a channel review? Or I really like you. Or here's a super chat thingy. Or here's a donation. Or it's building that engagement. So not yeah. only content creation, brand awareness, watch time, but it could make you money. So there's no reason not to create content. And anything that makes it easier makes it easier on you. Do does, does it work the same way with, with YouTube as it did originally with Facebook, where Facebook are like, well, we came up with Facebook Live. And so it's great that you're putting content and video content natively on Facebook. But if you put it out as Facebook Live content, we're going to push it harder. Do they do that or do they just look at it as more content? Because there is so much content being uploaded on a regular basis. Is it more just that's nice. It's another piece of content. Only oh, happen to have used live, but it's just nice that it's content. 
I, I've not seen any direct correlation between um, if, if it's restreamed via Restream IO or StreamYard or anything that connects it within. I've not seen any negative effects outside the fact that if you're using some of these tools, sometimes you don't keep track of those other networks you're beaming to. Yeah. Um, some tools can aggregate it. I know that Restream um, IO did for a while uh, where you'd plug in all the accounts and then in your own live stream, there'd be a little dashboard collecting all of the chats. It would tell you this is from Facebook, this is from Twitch, right? Yeah. That way you can integrate and interact, right? Otherwise, there's nothing more annoying than sitting there on YouTube watching a restream from Twitch or anything like that, and then you ask a question and it's poof, gone into the ether. Um, but if you are live streaming in YouTube in general, it does favor it. It's more urgent. It understands it's fresh, right. immediate, instant content. So it will push that over any of your on-demand pre-recorded stuff whilst you are live. So right okay. now, for example, this being streamed to Simon's YouTube, right? they will more likely suggest this video on the sidebar than any other of his back catalog until this live stream stops, and yeah. then it will go to the normal algorithm. A little they bit like TikTok, when you go through TikTok and if somebody's live, it'll tell you they're live because they want you to tap on that button and go yeah. and watch the live stream rather than suggesting any of the other. Cool. Okay, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, the, the next one is the community tab. Now, something I've, I've used sporadically um, on my channel. If There's a lot of people I think still might not have it. I don't know if it's been rolled out fully or not. It, is it, again, a bit of a fad? Or because I know YouTube stories are going to come eventually, which we'll talk about in a second, but it's, is it important to be putting stuff out there? I've started using it more, I must admit. I've been I've been better with it, but I don't get a huge amount of interaction on it. But I don't know whether that's because I've never used it or because it's just a lot of crap. Okay. Um, you've got 5,000-odd subscribers on your YouTube account, Simon. Mm -hmm. You do not interact with your community, Simon. Shame on you, Simon. There we go then. Okay. <laughs> the community tab is now available to anyone in the partnership program over 1,000 subscribers. Basically, you get a nice welcome package. Here, you can monetize your videos and give us 70% of your content. <laughs> and watch it there, communicate on your community tab. The community tab is a very powerful tool. But just like anything, if you don't use it, it becomes worthless. Mm -hmm. You've got to bear in mind the human psyche works in three ways, maybe four. Um, it, it goes by visual elements. So I interact with my community tab on a regular basis, almost daily. The same reason that you're tweeting and sharing on Instagram or TikTok or Tumblr or whatever dead platforms, right? Um, <laughs> the reason is, is if you show up, other people will too. So you need to prioritize in your community tab the following three, four things. One, polls. If you're asked an opinion, you love to give an opinion, right? Polls, pictures, they are visual, they tell a story, and they're engaging. Posts individually, text alone. And then finally, direct adverts. The reason for this is that if you was to post a just a video link to community tab, people know nowadays, that's an advert. I will ignore it, because we've been conditioned to do so, right? When was the last time you opened an advertising email and went, oh, I have to buy it? No, you haven't. For I was going to get that bump. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's yeah, you know, <laughs> it doesn't happen. So the reason the reason you're leaning in on those is that the, the polls, you're asking for someone's opinion, they're more than willing to vote. Everyone likes their good. Oh, I wonder, yeah. wonder what it's like. It's like and these these can be these can be very professional, or in my case, very stupid, right? I'll ask you how you are, or I'll ask you, does pineapple belong on pizza? Right? Or I'll I'll, I'll I actually directly poll, like, what type of videos do you want? Do you like shorts? Do you use shorts? Whatever it happens to be, right? And then I'll have a, a, a stupid little answer at the bottom, like, I am a dolphin. Or I'm. Reason is YouTube only wants engagement. Yeah. Full it doesn't care <laughs> what type of engagement it is. It doesn't care if it's a video. It doesn't care if it's a comment, a like, a share. It wants engagement. And the community tab is proof that you can master a community and an audience to come to you regularly even on days that you don't publish so if i was to put up a random poll and you pop over you've interacted with my channel today even though i haven't posted a video today it's a good sign for you now yeah. when i first started posting polls i got 20 30 votes 
Now I'm getting 300 votes ish at my top end and a load of comments. Now you've got to imagine that that's 300 votes, 20, 30, 50 comments, 20, 30, 50 likes, 400 pieces of engagement yeah. disappear if that post didn't exist at all. Plus, while you're there, oh, vote. Oh, whilst I'm here, I'll see what Alan did. And here's another video. And here's another one I suggested against. And also, the community tab posts are then featured on individual home pages. So next time, when you get a chance, load your own YouTube homepage, yeah. not the YouTube homepage, your YouTube homepage, because it's curated for you. Scroll down, and you will see around about the screen's length down at the bottom, community tab posts that have been pinned there. Okay. Scroll through. So in theory, you can get on top of that homepage. The advantage here is also that you can get on that homepage even if they are not subscribed to your channel. Because YouTube continues to be like, oh, hi, do you remember when you visited this person? Isn't he funny? Look at his cat photo. And then you <laughs> go through. Okay? So, yes, use the community tab to engage with the people that actually want to hear from you. Yeah. I've got 24,000 people. You've got 5,300-ish. They actively subscribe to see more of you. And you are just ignoring them. And I'm ignoring them. <laughs> and, and it kind of brings me on to the next thing that I did mention there as well, the stories, YouTube stories. I've been watching your stories. They're essentially Instagram stories. They are essentially TikToks, for example, or Snapchat. So whatever anybody uses on a vertical video basis to tell the behind-the-scenes story of what they've been up to that day. When are they going to become available for everybody? Because that's that is something I would probably use far yeah. more regularly than the community tab. Although now you've turned me off, I will use community as well. But um, yeah, okay. So there's there's two edges to the story. Um, one, the stories that are like Instagram stories are available to anyone that has over ten thousand subscribers. Now these will, over time, no doubt, roll back down. But it's kind of one of those premium kind of things. You get that and you kind of get a, a a nudge and you get like a community manager and stuff. Now, this does breed engagement. So YouTube will use it. And you get Instagram stories at any point that you wish as well. So why why would you gate that accordingly? Now, stories are useful. They're helpful. They are much limited than an Instagram story that you can link to to content. The most important next step is actually YouTube Shorts. An Instagram story is 15 seconds long. It goes on your, your bar at the top and you can search through. It flicks through just like an Instagram story, just like you're, you're used to for years. Or well, Snapchat in the good old days when I never used it because I was too old and it's weird. <laughs> right? I don't, don't want to change my face into a baby. Just stop it now. Right. So the YouTube Shorts program, however, are short stories that are up to 60 seconds in length. This is the TikTok attack. We've had TikTok banned in India. So mm -hmm. you are testing a beta in India, which are YouTube shorts. They are vertical format videos that are under 60 seconds. And as you scroll down on a mobile device, you can actually see the stories on a shelf underneath a recommended section of your content. Now, what this means is that you go to any video, mm -hmm. right? and then you scroll down. There you go. Yeah. See, that's how I see your content popping up. So, yeah. So on a mobile device, obviously, there are stories, which are these things that, that have the little icon, just like you would expect from, from Instagram. But at the start of that shelf now, you will see there are videos, actual video videos, mm -hmm. that don't have a little icon here. They can be up to 60 seconds in length. These are shorts. Now, because this is only being tested in India, you're going to feel that you're going to be a little left out. unless. You can use a new tool that YouTube suggested via their, their blog that if you want in on this, if you want to, your videos to be considered for that pool that's going to be placed in that shelf whilst they're testing it, you use a little hashtag that says shorts. Okay. okay. So you have a video that is, is that within the title or within the description. Shorts in either the title or the description. Okay. And what that says to YouTube is, hi, this kind of meets your 60 seconds vertical format <laughs> thing. Right. Mm -hmm. What that then means is that it puts it in the bucket. And then when it is relevant, I've noticed. So if you're talking about tech, there's a chance that your video that is you ripping apart a laptop might 
be displayed against Linus Tech Tips. Right? And they're testing this at the moment. Now, it's not directly affecting the launch of a video. It seems that you're placed on that shelf after about three to four days, maybe a week or longer, where it is relevant. So much so that I've created a second channel called Alan Spicer Unleashed. I was just going to say, is it worth creating a second channel? Because there's nothing I hate more than the double black band on the oh, side. Of it hurts my soul. That I've done <laughs> this. Um, the reason why I've done two channels is the people that have known me long enough, they know that I have a comedic edge to me. So I wanted a place to relax no. and be unniched in an area. So, yes, I still do vertical format videos on my main channel that are relevant to that niche where required. Why? Because it's, it's the wild, wild west. And at the moment, that new feature could be the thing that explodes. Could, could be. And the only way you're going to sh know that is by creating content. Because if you don't create content in there, then you didn't have a roll of the dice in that area in the first place. Sorry, really quick one for you. Because knowing with the community tab, you can upload videos to community. Could you do it that way instead of putting it onto your main channel? Then could you put a video that's vertical onto the community tab, hashtag shorts, and it'd be picked up? The only way that you can choose a video on the community tab is actually an uploaded live video. You're okay. not individually recreating content <clears throat> that stream so you'd yeah. have to upload publish it and then connect it and then it's an advert again so it still has to be on your content on your channel it anyway would, it, would need, it has to be public it has mm. to be for us in the western world it has to be public it has to be uploaded as a normal video you can thumbnail it however you want or choose not to and then whatever uh, freeze frame you choose is the freeze frame that's on it i can <laughs> upload niche specific videos to to there for anything mm. that happens really quick and so have other people including vidiq a little monster media co and people like that. Now, I've created the second channel to give me a little bit of freedom. So what I've been doing is, if you want to search for it, it's Alan Spicer Unniched. It's brilliant. Um, I don't have 100 subscribers on that channel yet, so it hasn't got a custom channel URL, but it will do at some point. But the reason why I've created that is that I can test my niche-based stuff on Alan Spicer. But mm -hmm. What I can do now is I can wake up in the morning, I can scroll through Google Trends and go, oh, you know what? I could do a video about the haunting of Bly Manor. Yeah. Brilliant. Uploaded it. And then maybe that then gets re related to a relevant search term that is trending right now. There's a, about 20 ish, 20, 30 -ish videos on that channel at the moment because I create content way too quickly and I could rip it over from TikTok and whatever. And some of those now, they'll launch like a normal video and then three or four days later, it's being picked up by the shorts algorithm. And it's obnoxious. You see, there's the graph, 90 degree angle. It just keeps going. And then it, <laughs> you can see you can see where it's been taken off the shelf. It's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right, it's, it's great, right? So, so that channel alone has been live for six days and has nearly 3000 views on it already. <laughs> Is the organic reach of the it just completely ignores everything. This this is proof that tags won't necessarily matter in the future if you have a video title that is obnoxiously obvious and that you relate it to a topic. Right now, for example, this morning the iPhone 12 is being released at some point today. So I knew that. And last Thursday I, I put a video saying, Look, I've got a new iPhone 12. And then I just wrote 12 on the back of the phone. <laughs> that this morning is now on a shelf and is getting dozens of views right now through a shelf on long form content on a channel that does not have many subscribers and is outperforming itself technically by metrics. Back to the point, a story and a short are two separate things. Story is 10,000 subscribers. Shorts, however, is a land grab that you might need. Yeah. Should you make a separate channel? Maybe if you want to. Mr. Beast has a separate channel just for his shorts. He's got 10 million subscribers on that channel now. Oh, you are subscribers, but... <laughs> it doesn't seem to monetize very well, but it, just like anything, it's a brand new feature that YouTube's really pushing right now. So can you really afford to not experiment and not learn it? Yeah. To have a play. Absolutely have a play. Cool. Right, let's have a, have a look at some of the questions that have been coming through. We've got a couple on um, the, the normal chat. We had a few come through on some of the channels as well. Um, on Instagram, um, uh, not Instagram, sorry, LinkedIn even, um, my friend Lex got in touch and he was like, I understand all the bits and pieces, the titling, 15 words in the title, thumbnails. He understands all of that, but... How do you create faithful fans is the question he's asking for. Um, and also he wants to know, is it worth using apps like vidIQ, which we'll come to in a second. Um, but the, the, the creating faithful fans, I mean, for me, 
I've preached about it consistently. Lex knows I do as well. Consistency, consistency, consistency. Give value and just have that level of patience. If you really want to try and keep them involved, ask them questions, include polls, whatever, like you say, how would you go? How have you gone about creating faithful fans? Is it just giving them what they want or what? It's all down to engagement. Imagine your favorite rock band, right? And you've gone to go and see them. You really love them, right? And then you go to the back back door after the end of a gig and they just ignore you. Or you you engage in certain things with them and they just don't care. That's the point where you, you build a, a, a distrust or a disconnection. I reply to as many, if not all of my comments. The reason for this is that they've made the the decision to comment. They've taken that time. Yeah. 100, 100 odd people, maybe a small percentage would comment, maybe a small percentage would then engage. It's those people that will actually make or break you. 1,000 true fans is something that can launch a business. Yeah. If you think of 1,000 true people that can, can that will buy that sock or that t-shirt or that, that mug. Now, if you're engaging with them, if you're giving them what they want, if you're using that community tab, right? Those are ways that you're giving back through communication. It could also mean that every now and then you throw out some personal stuff if you wish. You can access me quite easily using the, the YouTube stories. I do more personal stuff on there. Nothing like, I don't really talk about my family. I just tell you how I'm feeling, what I'm doing. On my Instagram stories for a very long time, I told people how I was going through blood tests and how I hate doctors and stuff like that. So just be a little bit more human. If you're a bit too robotic, then you lose that human element. You need people to associate with you and, and empathize with you. Yeah. Even if that means that, hi, I'm I'm learning this new skill. Be honest that you're learning. You're not an expert. You're learning, right? And that humility may actually win you people that are either experts or want to learn along with you. So yeah. a little bit in return, a little bit of humanity, and they'll. I think, you know, I think the way I've always described it as well is, um, especially when I'm doing my talks, is how it was described to me in radio, which was the people listening, or in this case, the people watching, you want them to be, want to be your friend. You want them, in the radio terms, was you want the women to want to spend time with you and you want the guys to want to go for a pint with you. Yeah. So you've got to talk to the audience. You've got to re relate to them. You've got to, Nobody buys anything without a level of an emotion. Even if it's an impulse buy, there's still that element of, I really like this, or that looks good on me, or I must have that computer. There's still that element of emotion. And I think that's so important when you're creating content, full stop, whatever content it is, blogging, video, podcasting, you've got to create that level of emotion between you and the audience members. Otherwise, they're just going to go, well, you're just another bloke saying the same things, and I don't really care. Especially with the size of YouTube. You've got to think that the thing that will make you stand out is you. If you're trying to be somebody else, or if you're trying to be nobody, then nobody's yeah. going to care. They need they need to find that connection. E even if it's like my new channel, I'm actively sharing my cat. I love my cat. It's fluffy. Have you got a cat? Have you got a dog? It, look, look at these weird... It's a human side of me that I couldn't necessarily show in a more professional light. So mm -hmm. you can't necessarily do it on your main channel. If you give them options somewhere to, to build it, then they, they can identify with you and that builds loyalty over time yeah going on to his other question then um if people have been eagle-eyed they'll see in the background a, a reason why we're asking this um or why we both smiled when i asked it um is it worth using apps like vidiq <laughs> yes now no tool is a silver bullet right you you could you could do everything that the vidiq app tells you to do full stop right you could get a perfect score but that doesn't guarantee that it goes viral. It just means that you've done the groundwork for it to do what it needs to do. It's just like making sure that the soil's the right thing, the feed's the right thing, that you're watering your plant correctly. That plant just might not grow. It might take time. It might need time to, to, to get used to its surroundings, or it might be too competitive. There may be too many trees crowding that, that, that floor. Right? And that's the same with, with any form of keyword management tool. Now, VidIQ does make it easier to tick as many boxes as possible or mm -hmm. for you to be educated about the, the choices that you are doing. Now, I personally know that due to the climate that I'm in now and me switching from another company to VidIQ, 
I now exclusively use the vidIQ tool and I've gone from 10, 11,000 subscribers to 24,000 subscribers. So I know that once you learn a tool, it's helpful, but it is a tool box, right? Yeah. Some people will always need a mallet. Some people will always need the screwdriver. Maybe you need a drill, right? And you use them for the specific task you are using. You can't just throw the toolbox at a flat pack furniture and go, Poom. oh, it's done. That's not how it works. But if you learn how the toolkit works. Now, VidIQ is fantastic at data-based work. So you have a look at your keywords. You have a look at how it's recommended based on the keyword volume and the competition, right? But as I said, taking individual things out, like I really love the, the thumbnail preview tool in which you're able to compare your thumbnail against other people in your niche. That way, that's, if I'm worried, that's what I've used a lot recently, especially after our last chat, is um, the, the, the thumbnail, because um, it's available on the free version, so you can yeah. you can have a look. And Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's great to, well, to go, okay, maybe I need to just tweak that a bit or something. But Well, that's it. It, it gives you a chance to compare. That, if you're uploading identical-ish versions of your thumbnail to all of your rivals, how are you going to stand out? A thumbnail is supposed to help you stop them scrolling and to make them click. So if all of your thumbnails are the same as everybody else's and you're stood on the left hand side and there's the same font and it's all blue, then maybe this tool will tell you that maybe if you just used red or yellow, you're so different that people will click on you specifically. So these these tools out of the toolkit, individual things will help you with individual things. Whether in my case, as I've got bigger, I'm now tracking my competitors to see what trends they are talking about, what things that I could jump in on or make better videos on that are related to. Whereas if you're a smaller YouTuber looking to learn the basics, then it will teach you you need a good end screen, you need a good thumbnail, you have a look at your tags, you need to learn how to write your description. It will suggest the keywords that you might want to put in your title, right? And it's only going to get more powerful over time as well. It needs to help you evolve, and so will the tool with time as well. And um, a quick one that came through on the live while we've been live, actually, is Ed McIntyre, and he's asking the question, playlists, what are they, for a start? Well, that's an easy one, hopefully. Uh, why are they there? Are they needed? Needed? Should you use them? How do you use them? OK. Wow. Just a few bits oh, yeah. there. <laughs> playlists is a good way for you to um, collect all videos based on a certain topic, OK? The reason why this is helpful is that 50 to 75% of all people that come to your channel will not watch all of your videos. There are some zealots that will watch everything and scrutinize every fine detail of whether you know, you've got a scratch on your forehead or whether you've got gray hairs, right? Those people exist, right? But the idea of a playlist will help you funnel people into an area that they want. So in my YouTube channel in itself, I teach you how to start a YouTube channel, how to grow a YouTube channel, how to use specific features, right? How to make money off of that process in itself and other tools and functionality that you may want to do it. That's four or five areas of my channel. Now, if I mash that all into one playlist, it's a bit confusing, but I only want videos about money, Alan. That's the wrong finger. I only want... <laughs> What, what, what videos about money? I only want to learn how to the, the business of YouTube. Okay. <clears throat> so if you place it in a playlist, they don't have to scroll through 50 videos to find the three videos that are relevant to them. So the playlist yeah. will also playlists help accentuate the power of that content. So if I had to flick through five videos before I watch the business one, another five videos before I watch the business one, right? That might turn my brain off and I might not watch all of it, which then harms not only click-through rate, but retention rate and watch time. But if there's a playlist that I know that I'm going to listen to, I'm, I'm a huge Gary Vaynerchuk fan. It's only taken me 58 minutes to mention him on a live stream. That's a record for me, right? Um, but what I do is I I, I drop off my, my four-year-old at uh, her school. I'll turn on motivational Gary Vaynerchuk stuff, which is six, seven, eight minutes long, right? And it will auto play that playlist. And then I just listen to those. That helps me because I continue to get my positive reinforcement over and over again. And I'm not having to flick through those videos. And now I can drill into that specific niche or whatever I want. So they help and they can help your retention and your watch time rate because that way you're funneling people into where they want to be. And because they're now there, they will stay there comfortably and yeah. then 
you need to consume your content, they're more likely to watch the next and the next and the next because it's all in their relevant niche rather than having to, oh, that one's done, I'll just scroll, where was it? Click. So you, it makes it less friction, more helpful. Fab. Hopefully that's answered your question, Ed. Um, right, okay, we have Gina who uh, dropped me a DM on Twitter. And she's saying, I put captions onto my videos, but is it better to upload them directly to YouTube or burn them into my content so I can put the videos elsewhere with, with subtitles? Some people do both. Captions help, full stop. It will localize your content. It can give you a wider market. My YouTube channel analytics in itself is the first best region is the US, the second is in India, and the third is the UK. So I now make sure that because I know that my audience is India-based second, I then make sure that captions have like uh, Hindi and Urdu and, and Gujarati and stuff like that, because it makes, once again, less friction. The easier it is to consume your content, the better. Now, it also comes with the fact that captions are metadata and also feed that big jigsaw puzzle piece picture. So once again, 100 piece jigsaw piece puzzle thingy, right? And if you upload all your content and the title and the description and tags, and there's 50 of them, there's your 50 puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. But if you're adding your captions, then that can also be indexed and searched accordingly, especially if there's specific things that you're saying over and over again. Um, maybe there's things that you need to pronounce that may be better if they read it. Some people read it whilst on the go because not everyone listens to videos. They might read it. It depends on the platform in itself. Now, if you feel that it doesn't take away from it being burnt at the bottom of a YouTube video, fine. YouTube has its own caption system for a reason, but if it's burnt into an Instagram video, people are used to that. Yeah. Um, more people... Does YouTube yeah. recognize it then if you've if you burnt it in? Does it go? Because obviously the video will also have some background data that people don't see. Does YouTube recognize that background data and go, oh, hang on, you've actually put captions in. So it's not great because we'd rather you use our tools, but we know they're there. Does it recognize if it, that? If it's burnt into the video, it, it obviously can't identify the exact words in it. Mm -hmm. The machine learning algorithm, the, the thing that I was talking about before, yeah. the cloud learning the reason why I deliberately start all of my videos with hmm, how to start, how, how to add a thumbnail. Whoop, I know that somewhere that that machine at some point will see how to thumbnail and then it will learn it. So for me, I'm do, doing that deliberately for my own thing. But if you were to upload and burn captions, it's not going to read those captions and then caption it for you. So I always advise that if you're going to upload it to YouTube, upload it as a separate caption file that people can choose to turn on and off. Give them the option to use yeah. it and then it can localize it accordingly. But on platforms like Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that, where it's more accepted that I'll be reading off the thing because both of those are muted at standard Twitter videos were in, uh, immediately muted as standard, then you, you'll then have the captions to read and people yeah. accept from there. Fab. Alan, we've we've kind of gone through our questions, apart from the one where Angelina's asking, why can't the lasses go for a pint with me as well? Um, so, <laughs> um, so we've gone through our questions. I, I think this has been invaluable again to people. Um, there's just so much to learn. Things are constantly evolving. I mean, last time we were talking, about, I think the big nugget for me, last time we talked about the timestamps, this time YouTube Shorts, I think is um, is definitely the one for a lot of people to take away from today. I mean, there's so much, but I think that's the one big thing that I'm definitely going to take away from today. That And I, sh I should be using the community tab. Community tab. People yeah. want to hear from you, so talk to them. And see, the, the advantage when it comes to Shorts as well is, as I said previously, if, if you're... For me, I, my YouTube Shorts channel, I'm, I'm, I'm never aiming to monetize. If it gets there, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Right? <clears throat> this, this is a little bonus that I'll throw out there. I've been working on my mental health a lot lately because I've been grinding at YouTube for eight years. I've finally started to make a, a, a very good income from it over the last three years. Right? But YouTube burnout is a real thing that can really hurt you not just your career, not just your business, but you personally. Yeah. So over the last few months, I've been slowly slimming down things that, that don't necessarily require so much of 
my my work time and my effort. So certain clients are, are either no longer with me or I've moved them on occasionally. But I've also made sure that I go out of my way to find ways to inspire my own brain, whether it's walking out on the weekends or, in this case, the YouTube Shorts channel as well, where I'm so rigid on my Alan Spicer channel all about how-tos and YouTube and social media that there's a part of my brain that has my comedic sense of humor. Yeah. So I now have an outlet to dump all of my weirdness elsewhere that allows me to be two parts of me and it won't hurt my main channel. Yeah. But it also gives me that creative outlet that means that I don't hate creating stuff for YouTube because oh, I want to be funny, that channel. Oh, I want to be educational, that channel, right? That way I've got the blessing that I've got that mind gap between the fun and the business. Yeah. So if you've got that chance to do so, then great. If this is your way of dabbling around with YouTube shorts, like going to the gym or talking about what, what baby food you happen to be giving for little, like little Max or whatever it happens to be, then maybe you could do that separately. But understand that if you start any YouTube channel, you are resetting back to zero. So don't immediately think, well, there was 5,000 subscribers over here. Why aren't all 5,000 over here? That's not how it works. Yeah. Right? But it could be the mental health gap that you need to still feel invigorated about creating. So now yeah. I make a couple of funny videos that I really love, and now I'm in a mood to record. So I'll go and record some professional videos a little bit. Now, if you want to check out the other interview, 50 odd minutes packed full of powerful tips, it is here and a playlist here of all the micro content that came out of it as well. Little bite-sized chunks of golden YouTube gorgeousness.